Hey, welcome back to the channel. Exciting build video today. We're gonna to be building two window bench seats with active lids as well as a custom Lavoured vent here on the bottom. I think you guys are gonna enjoy this one. So getting started here on milling our material for our window bench seat, the first thing I'm gonna do is make my face frame that will go across the front. There's a couple goals here that we have when we're doing this. Number one, we want to mill our material so that it's straight. Number two, we want to mill our material so it's equidistant. So whether I'm running it through the table saw on my second pass after the joiner or running it through the planer on my second pass, I wanna make sure I'm getting that material exactly the same width across all my pieces. It just makes everything more crisp and easy to put together later. One of the key things I like to do after I've got my material jointed is to always stack it with the jointed edge down so that I can keep track of which edge has been machined. Um, this little cart is working pretty nice for stuff like this just to be able to wheel around the shop. The third key thing I'm paying attention to when I'm milling face frame material is saw marks on my cut edge. So whenever I run the material through the joiner first, with my helical head on the joiner, it's gonna leave a very glass-like finish uh, after I run that through. So it's gonna need basically no sanding at all. However, if I run it through the table saw on my second pass to rip to width, I'm gonna have some saw marks. So oftentimes I will oversize my material by about a 16th or so whenever I make my rip to width and then I will process the material further through the, <clears throat> through the planer to remove those saw marks. Since we're just doing a very small project here and I'm not having a bunch of the same width materials, um, I can probably get away with just using the table saw and doing a little light sanding. I will also note that starting out, I like to cut my, my lengths of material long before I process it and mill it, and then I'll go back and cut it to the final uh, length later on after it's all nice and square. One of the other advantages to leaving your material long before you mill it is you can have longer pieces and run like a long stick of this material through the planer and then you only have to worry about snipe on the ends of a long board. Whereas if you had these pieces cut to length at this point, it would not be ideal to try to run those through a planer at this point. At this point, we are ready to cut these to length. Um, these pieces here, we ran through the planer on one side and jointer on the other side. So both edges are glassy smooth and the width is gonna be absolutely perfect. These pieces here, uh, one edge is through the table saw, so we do have saw marks, but it'll be face down towards the floor, and uh, it's just not a big deal on that. These pieces will also be cut into vertical styles, and uh, one edge will be towards the wall where it won't be seen. So again, uh, this will actually be scribed to the wall, so keeping that cut edge on these pieces is not a big deal. So I kind of strategically mill the pieces according to what I need from each piece. It is a good idea before you start milling to length to just verify that your stop block is calibrated. I've been using this Craig stop block system for a lot of years, had it in my old shop as well. It's a nice system, but it's not um, industry, industrial quality. You can't just be like bashing boards into it and expect it to stay in place, um, but it works pretty good. So we'll, we'll be mindful of that as we push our boards into it. The other thing you have to pay attention to is sawdust buildup. Um, if you have sawdust, that's on your table and you're pushing your stop block in place, that will move your piece over and you won't get accurate lengths. As we're milling these pieces to length, you will notice I am putting a fresh square cut on the beginning of every piece before I bump up to my stop block. It's just a habit Always remember, assumption is the mother of all screw ups. Um, I can assume that there's a square cut on the end of a piece, 
but it opens up the possibility for that not to be the case and us to have time-wasting problems later on. So as a general habit, I do just like to start with a square cut um, before I bump up against my stop block. Next on my face frame, I have these small vertical styles that are 10 and 3 quarter long. My stop block does not go over to 10 and 3 quarter to be able to cut these. I have a couple options. I could just measure and mark, which would be just fine. There's only four pieces. Or I can use a 10 inch block to offset uh, my width. And instead of going to 10 and 3 quarters, I'll move my block over to 20 and 3 quarters with a 10 inch block. That should give me 10 and 3 quarters uh, whenever I cut this then. Now that we've got all of our face frame pieces cut to length, the next step is pocket hole mortising. So I love my castle pocket machine. And whenever I'm doing face frames, it works pretty good to have the machine just at the end of my miter saw station here because I can just kind of stack my material either on the actual bench top itself or up here. It's kind of full right now, so it's just on the countertop. But uh, it just basically moves down and flow and works really well. This machine is foot pedal actuated. So once it's on, you just got to push down on the pedal with your foot and this big hogging router bit will come up and uh, make our mortise while at the same time, there's another smaller drill bit that pre-drills a hole through the end. And basically all we need to do is make sure that we're making contact and pushing in one of these two little uh, bolt heads right here. Those are adjustable. So piece goes in like that, pushes up against, we put our foot pedal down and it makes the mortise and it's very fast, works really good. Now our next detail we have to tackle is a vent that is going to go in the bottom of this unit. You'll see here I've got like a lavoured vent drawn in. It's a floor vent. We got to deal with it. And this is something you just want to do as quickly and effectively as possible. These are the kinds of details that separate successful carpenters from average carpenters. You have to be able to formulate a plan and execute quickly whenever you have obstacles like this. A lot of guys, they get bogged down and start watchmaking. Uh, they see a Lavoured vent and they just take absolutely forever to come up with a method to execute the task. And then a lot of times their method is not a very fast method and then they're just slow at it. And whenever you're looking at production carpentry, we're trying to build things at a, at a competitive price point. We can't afford to let a couple of Lavoured vents turn into a day of shop labor. We gotta do it fast. Now fast does not mean that we don't execute with an extremely high level of precision. Again, this is what separates great carpenters from average carpenters. We're gonna make a quick jig, CA glue, couple pieces of scraps, um, mark out where you want your vent, vent location to be, and then we're just gonna use this template to route out the opening. It's gonna be very precise, very accurate, and it's gonna look really good. It doesn't take long at all to take a little bit of CA glue and some blocks, glue it all together, and uh, we're ready to go. You'll see here, this one I have completed already, and I'm getting ready to do the next one. I've got my pencil lines marked out. I'm gonna take this over to the table saw and I'm gonna cut it so that I'm leaving about a 16th of meat inside that pencil line, which will then route out with a flush bit and our template. Uh... 
By the way, anytime you're making a plunge cut on the table saw like this, you have to be extremely careful. We have no riving knife in there. Um, as I'm making this plunge cut, that means that this blade can grab a hold of this board and throw it very, very easily. I've got a glue line blade. There's not a ton of teeth. It wouldn't take much for this blade to grab a hold of this board and absolutely fling it like a missile. So you gotta keep a firm hold on it. You will notice I did start with the blade lower. I find that makes it easier to get the piece into place. And generally, whenever you're plunging over a blade, you want to be slightly pushing into it, just as if you were cutting the board. Whenever you allow a board to go into reverse, that's whenever you give those teeth an opportunity to grab a hold of it and throw it. But if we're going forward, we're cutting forward, we reduce the chance of kickback, and then you would note, you'd notice I did raise, kept it firmly down, and then raise the blade up. The reason for that is just simply it makes much more of a vertical cut and it allows me to get closer to my pencil line doing that. So you gotta be extremely careful whenever you do this. I would not start with a blade this high. You're just asking for trouble to start with it that high, trying to drop the board down onto that. So next we'll finish the cutout with a jigsaw, again leaving about a sixteenth of meat inside our pencil line that we will flush trim out. After we've carefully made our cut with the jigsaw, we'll take our template, nail it in place with four 23 gauge pin nails. Now we just flip this over. We'll put a little bit of clamp on it so that it doesn't move around whenever we're trying to work on it here. But then it's pretty simple quarter inch flush bit. We'll go around it and uh, that's all there is to it. So we're done with this template. We can throw it in the trash. If we wanted to reuse it, all we've got to do is uh, break off those pin nails and it would be ready to use again. Now I've got my pieces cut for my vent. Um, pretty simple stuff here, just a bunch of strips, planed them down. We got about a half inch, no, maybe it's three eighths on the outside. And then these are five sixteenths and a five sixteenths gap. As you can see, I've got marks on here um, where we're gonna line everything up. We'll use glue, pin nails, then we'll clamp it and then everything is gonna be long so I can cut the end exactly, cut it down the middle, and uh, basically tweak my length exactly as I need it. But we're gonna make one big long piece here. And you will notice it is an inch thick. I ripped all of this out of four quarter material. That way I can glue it up and run it through the planer and I don't have to worry about all these pieces being perfectly aligned because we're gonna plane it all off nice and smooth on both sides. All right, so now popping this bad boy off the clamps, everything looks good so far. I'm gonna go ahead and run this through the planer first as one long length. That'll help with snipe uh, and stuff like that. And then we'll actually cut it in half right here, cut it to length that I need, get it fit up, sand it up, and uh, we'll see how it looks. Alrighty, so here we go. Um, there it is. It's about a 16th narrower. Um, so we got about a 30 second, you know, gap around. It'll make a little shadow gap. We've got the edges sanded, but I think this looks really good. I also wanted this to be removable. That way I could reach in and seal under this cavity and then they'll be able to uh, dust it and whatnot as well if they need to get in there and access that vent area. So. Very happy with how this came out. Pretty simple stuff. Just gluing some uh, little strips of wood together, planing them, cutting them to length. You just got to make a plan and um, execute as quickly as possible on stuff like this. So very pleased. Oh, um, since I routed, I had that quarter inch um, round over in the corner and I just matched that on the corner of my pieces here. Um, I always have this bit chucked up at my workbench here. So I just hit it with a 
five thirty second radius bit on this outside corner, and I think it it'll match up pretty nice, as you can see there. And now we are on to assembling our face frame. So with my print, I've got the parts marked here where each piece is going to go. I've got my screws preloaded and we're ready to start assembly. You will notice here I've got my um, assembly table. It's got dog holes everywhere. That comes in handy to use clamps like this um, for assembling face frames. Most of the time, I just end up using a Craig Automax clamp and I'll just kind of pull it off to the side and clamp it and that works pretty good. It just depends on the size of the face frame and, and kind of how I want to do it. Now because we did use the Castle pocket hole machine, I am using the screws that they recommend. It's a little bit different design than your typical Craig style washer head screws. So I kind of switch to these whenever I'm using the Castle machine, it works out pretty good. Again, using my print here to measure over where these intermediate parts are gonna go. Um, but yeah, we're ready to rock and roll. Because this is longer than eight feet, uh, it's 100 inches, I'm gonna start on this end and kind of work the other way. Whenever you glue up face frame pieces, you really don't need a ton of glue. You wanna just get coverage and uh, you're putting it together quickly so it just doesn't take much. I'll get that on there, make sure I don't have saw marks towards the inside. I've got my saw marks towards the outside here. And like I said, a lot of times I'll just kind of pull the work pieces over the edge, grab my Automax clamp, put that on there. Some key points when we're doing face frames. First off, always sand with my Festool ETS EC 150 slash five millimeter. That five millimeter stroke really cuts through the material nice and quickly. And then this blue pad here, you see that's a hard pad. And it's awesome for face frames because it keeps everything perfectly flat. So it's gonna paint up nice. You will notice here on the front side of my face frame, I have very slightly eased this edge. This is a standard practice of mine. I use this 1 16th inch white side pilot point router bit that allows me to get into the corners here. And what that does is it'll make this edge more durable. It'll paint up a little bit better than having a really crisp edge. Um, and it's just something that I like to do whenever we have site finished cabinets. So this one's done and I'll be ready to move on to my second face frame now. Guys, I wanna point something out here about the, uh, the castle machine pocket that I have here. It's at a much lower angle than your typical um, Craig pocket hole machine will do. And the crazy thing about this is I don't even need a clamp with these screws. I can actually assemble without a clamp a lot of times. Um, and whenever you're doing little pieces like this, time is money and um, being able to just press down by hand on the workbench here, it's just crazy. Uh, if you try to do this with a typical Craig machine, I mean, your joints would creep and they would no longer be flush and it just simply doesn't work. You would have to have a clamp on it. But um, the Castle machine is just a different animal. Having that low angle makes a huge, huge difference. And, uh, it'll allow you to even be able to do this without needing any clamps. So here we go again. Now, most of the time when it's easy to do so, I will still use clamps, but that's primarily because um, it just removes the struggle a little bit more. I don't have to be as attentive to the joint as I'm assembling it if I know there, there's a clamp on it. Whereas when you are just pressing down on the table, you kind of got to have your head in the game 
and make sure you've got firm pressure and, and all of that good stuff. So here on the end, I'll go ahead just for the sake of simplicity still and, uh, and put a clamp on this, make it easy on myself. But they just come out truly perfect with these low angle castle pocket holes. Another little trick, whenever you're clamping up your face frame parts, if your board isn't exactly where you need it to be, put the clamp on it, and then if you twist it in either direction, the joint will move in either direction you need it to. It makes it really easy to adjust things exactly where you need them. It's now time to move on to actually building our window bench seat. Now the nice thing with this particular job is I have two of the exact same units to build for this house. So I've already went ahead and put one together. That way you can see what we're actually gonna be building. Just as a quick overview before we get started, you'll see our face frame is attached to the carcass already. I've got my removable vent cover right there. That's looking really good. Now construction method, you'll see I've got three quarter inch plywood going all the way around here, horizontal grain there, vertical grain on my uh, uprights. This is all gonna be painted so it really wouldn't have to be this way, but that's how I did it anyways. You will notice this piece right here it is there because we're going to have a lid that's gonna fold down with a piano hinge. And I like to have that joint resting on a piece of material here. That way if somebody stands on it, it's fully supported right there. You will also notice right here on my plywood, I did edge band the top of it. Reason being when this lid folds up, this will be visible. And whenever that's painted, I wanna see it nice and smooth. Um, rather than being plywood end grain right there. As we assemble our pieces of the carcass together, I like to use a crown stapler whenever the fastener holes will not be visible. This will be in between two walls, so really the only thing visible is gonna be across the face here. So as long as I minimize my exposed fasteners on the face and inside the carcass, I'll use staples, exposed screws, whatever I want to do to get this assembled as quickly as possible. Window bench seats are something that I have built a ton of over the course of my career. They're a very popular trim detail to add in a house. Sometimes they have active lids. Sometimes the lids are fixed and it's more of a seat to sit on. There's all kinds of different ways you can build these. There's no right way to do it. Um, in this case, I opted to use three quarter plywood all the way around rather than use quarter inch plywood. There's a lot of different advantages. If you're using three quarter everywhere, you can use large staples through it. You can use pocket holes. You can use drywall screws and it's got meat to grab into. You can edge band it. Whenever we're actually uh, installing this, if I've got three quarter on the back, I can fasten straight through that and fasten it to the wall and I don't have to have a stretcher or a nailer piece to run screws through because the quarter inch wouldn't hold a screw or a nail like three quarter will. So those are some of the reasons why I opted to use three quarter inch plywood all the way around this. As you see here, I've got all of my carcass parts laid out on my assembly table, but there is a very important point I want to make and that is, I draw up my built-ins in SketchUp and use the layout function to print off very nice, high quality, detailed prints like you can see here. I'll tell you that the number one uh, reason for screw-ups that I've had when building built-ins is because I did not follow my own drawings. So sometimes I'll be building something and then I'll think, oh, you know what, I don't really like that proportion, I'm gonna change it and then I fail to realize that that affects a different thing. And instead of following my drawings exactly, I'm kind of modifying as I go. That's a really great way to make mistakes. 
and um, have to throw something away and redo it. So get your drawings right the first time and then follow them. Most of the time when I'm building built-ins, I do all of my face frame parts first, do all the milling for those first, and then I switch over to plywood. One of the reasons for that is because then I can use an actual plywood blade and uh, it really reduces the splintering on my edges and gives me much better results than using like a 40 tooth combo blade. Also, before starting to put anything together, always sand all of your parts first. That is absolutely essential. Even on nice high quality plywood like this, the grain is gonna be raised. It's not gonna be super smooth. So hitting it with my Festool sander with hard pad, real quick with 120 get grit, flattens that grain, makes it nice and smooth, and it's gonna paint up so much nicer having sanded it. You will notice here at this point, um, I kept the bottom of these side units as low as possible to maximize storage pace, space. However, in this center unit, kept it up higher because we have a floor vent right underneath there that's gonna blow air out. And then this piece right here, this is going to support the lid again. Um, so that's what that's doing, but it also acts as a nice spacer to keep everything kind of where it needs to be. The next thing I'll do is put my back panel on. Now the back panel on a cabinet is really the part of the cabinet that's going to square the cabinet and also add a lot of rigidity. With this, again, because I'm using um, three-quarter plywood here on the back, uh, I can, I've got options as far as fastening. I could pocket hole screw into this back panel from, from the underside. Um, but in this case, I'm, I'm looking for speed and ease. So I'm gonna use my cordless crown stapler here. Basically, you just wanna go to both ends. Make sure you've got the, the saint you're centered, basically. And then I'm actually gonna work down to ensure that each of these vertical partitions is flush across the front. So that looks good. That one looks good. And right there. So that's stapled now. So this is the part where we're trying to square it. We want to look at the bottom and again ensure that we're flush, and if we're not flush, we want it to be either overhanging or underhanging the same on both sides so that the unit's nice and square. So I like it right there. Give it a tack. Go back to the other end. We'll hit that again also. Can work my way down the outside edges. This back panel is gonna be completely hidden, so I'm not really worried about uh, the fact that I'm stapling it a lot. It's just simply not gonna be seen. On these vertical pieces, I mean, you could try to eyeball it, but usually that doesn't work out well. So I like to just square it up, put a pencil line up the back side so I can be sure that I'm putting these big crown staples directly in the center. These are, inch and a half long crown staples. So they give me a nice hold, but you don't want them popping out anywhere. It's gonna make a mess. So taking some time to ensure that you're right on the line and you're splitting the plywood right down the middle is uh, worth the extra time. Always keep staples right in the workbench where they're easy to grab. Now we'll uh, mark the bottom where I need to nail that. We'll go ahead and flip this so the back is faced up. And I know I've got a half inch offset here and if I add 3 8 to that, I'll be at 7 8 to the center of the plywood. So I'm just gonna take my double square here, mark the center line of this plywood across the back. Then I've got this panels higher up right here. Loosen my double square, push it in, tighten it up. I've got four and a half inches. I will add three eighths to that. Gives me four and seven eighths. 
mark the center line on that. And again, we can go to town with our stapler. Always make so the staple is running parallel with the plywood. Obviously, if you turn it so that it's perpendicular, there's a lot more of a chance of the staple blowing out uh, or not hitting perfectly in the center. I will say one of my favorite tools to have at the workbench assembly table is my cordless Milwaukee crown stapler. This is a quarter inch crown stapler. Um, it'll go up to inch and a half length staples and it just works great because I don't have to drag a hose around. Little bit of an expensive tool compared to having a pneumatic stapler, but it's well worth it in my opinion. There are so many different assembly philosophies that you can use for a cabinet like this. Um, you could use glue and a few staples. You could use no glue and more pocket holes. Um, you could clamp things. There's just, there's no right answer or wrong answer. I generally defer to the combination of what's gonna give me the least amount of exposed fasteners and what's gonna be the fastest. So in this case, as I assembled this, I could put five staples up each side. None of them are gonna be seen along with a little glue that's gonna be bulletproof. Here in this center one, it'll be exposed on the inside. So I didn't really wanna pepper it with staples. I put two staples in each, but then I did go ahead and bore some um, pocket hole mortises on the underside here. So I'll go ahead and screw these in and finish that out and it'll make this nice and strong with minimal exposed fasteners on the inside. So it's really just a matter of finding the combination that you're comfortable with, with the price point and quality that you're shooting for. Another thing worth noting, um, I'm, I ha I've had the Castle machine for about a year um, and as compared to the Craig machine, they're a little bit different in how the mortise actually is shaped. So whenever I'm doing my face frame and doing hardwood, I use these more pan head style screws is what they, which is what they recommend. However, these will suck through plywood pretty easily just because they got a little bit smaller head as compared to your typical like Craig washer head screw. So when I'm assembling, even with the castle machine, lately I've been using these washer head screws. These are actually by Craig, but um, I'm using those on plywood. Just one of those little subtle nuances. Now we will go ahead and roll this over and put our front panel on. Whether or not you glue, um, it's a little bit of a personal preference thing. This is going to be painted on the inside. So I don't mind adding a little bit of glue. If we get a tiny amount of squeeze out or I happen to smear something, it's not gonna be as big of a deal. If it's stain grade on a situation like this, then I am not going to be gluing it. I'm just gonna be using more fasteners. Reason being, whenever you go and try to position this in place, you gotta be just extremely careful that you just basically drop it into place perfectly. Otherwise, you're gonna have glue smear. So I probably, uh, I shoot just to have a moderate amount of coverage. I don't want to over glue something like this because I don't want squeeze out, but I do like just knowing that I'm getting a little bit of extra strength by adding some glue here. But where I'm going to actually be stapling this into place, all of the fasteners are gonna be hidden by the face frame panel. So I got that going for me. So I'm gonna try trying to get that end lined up perfectly. And that way, whenever I drop this into place, it's gonna be exactly where it should be. And we're not, if you're sliding this all around, you're getting glue everywhere on the inside, it just looks like garbage, I can't stand it. So that's why uh, you just gotta be really careful with the glue. Putting this front panel on is a little bit trickier. I want the top to be perfectly flush with my vertical uprights. However, I don't have anything holding these in place right here to give me my perfect uh, distance of separation like I had when I had these stretcher pieces on the back. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make sure this is perfectly flush on the top where I want it, but then I'm gonna feel down here 
on the bottom on both sides, make sure I'm centered, and I'm gonna start down here in terms of tacking it. Now the other thing is I can see I'm actually flush down here on this end, but my, my vertical pieces in the center here are in about a 16th. So for whatever reason, I've got a little bit of a bow. Um, you gotta just kind of work the cabinet a little bit. Again, this is the disadvantage of gluing. But so now I'm gonna get this flush. Um, since I've got to work it a little bit, I'm gonna go ahead and nail this end right here. And before I nail this in place, I'm gonna check my width. Looks really good. And then I'll move down to the next one over here as well. Now it's slightly off, so I'm gonna pull this back up till it's flush. Check my width again. Looks good. And now, down here on the end, I can flush up the top, tack the bottom, make sure I have the same uh, either level of flushness or offset going up this side, tack this top. So now I'm basically ready to nail all this off. I still have my double square set up for whenever we mark the other side. So I can just start by marking this middle. That'll give me the center there. Then I'll move this back to seven eighths where I wanted it. Mark the bottom over here. And that'll just give me some reassurance as I'm stapling everything. Keep in mind here, our face frame is going to cover all of these areas where I'm gonna be stapling and I strategically designed it that way. Um, so I can really pepper this with as basically as many staples as I want and none of them are gonna be exposed. So you'll remember that we have this vent going on in the bottom. So I am gonna to have to cut that out first before we permanently attach the face frame on the front of this. I'll go out here to my ends. I know I need two inches on both sides. Just check, check two inches, make sure it's centered, make sure it's flush across the top. Now, one thing I personally hate is these floor vents in cabinets. I think that they just don't work, you know, nearly as good as they're supposed to. But uh, I am gonna go ahead and just narrow up this cavity with a couple pieces of plywood under here. And this is just going to be um, reducing the size of this so that we, again, get as much airflow straight out of this vent as possible. Putting this face frame on, it'll go on like so. And again, it'll cover all of my previous staple holes. How do we do this with as few exposed fasteners as possible? I'm just gonna glue it uh, a couple of pin nails across the top, and then I can actually screw in from the underside. So you'll see that my vent's right under here. It'll blow air 
out through there. And then our vent cover will just pop right into place like that. If you ever wonder why your work just doesn't seem to be coming out as accurately as it should, having a bunch of adhesive stuck on the end of your tape measure might be part of the problem. It's now the next day. Uh, I had the tops to complete yet, and then I'd like to take these to the job site and get them installed today. The video was getting a little long and the project was getting a little long, so I went ahead and just got this over with. We basically have a white oak top with a nosing glued across the front of that. It's gonna look really nice. And then our lower cabinet will all be paint grade. You will notice I've got three different lids um, on each unit. This is strategically designed so that the splices for my lid all land basically halfway on top of my vertical dividers here. And then we've got a piece on the end and then a piece across the back. I will have a piano hinge that will mount on the back side of each of these lids and that'll be the hinge mechanism. You will notice across the pieces on this lid, it is grain matched. I very carefully cut these and labeled them so that I'll be able to have this grain match flow through all of these lids. To cut the lids to width, I essentially took the inside measurement uh, that I had on my box and then added 5 16 on both sides of that. And so then this measurement that I have written on here represents the width of each of these panel pieces. So by adding 5 16 to both sides, that gave me 5 8 which allowed for an eighth inch margin between my lid panels. I've done these lids a lot of different ways in the past. On a smaller window bench unit, a lot of times I'll just make the whole top panel and then I'll take my track saw and cut out my lid. This ensures that I have the exact same margin all the way around. In this case, my, my wall to wall width is actually 100 inches. So I can't span that whole length with one sheet of plywood. However, I could span that whole length from the end of my lid to the end of my lid. And then I can just add in a three inch piece uh, or so on, on each end. So that's kind of the strategy I'm using here. Again, there's no perfect way to build these things. You just have to do what makes sense with each situation. Now, the way I built this, you'll notice that as this um, hinges up, it's going to rest on this back piece here, which will provide back support, and then it will have continuous support on these vertical dividers. The other advantage of, of building it this way is I can add a soft close mechanism on the, on the inside of this vertical divider and then attach it to the lid at each one of these ends if I choose to do that. Another random side note, again, these are grain matched going across. So I do have it marked on the back side, B left. So this panel is B and then I've got the left side, middle and right side all marked so I can keep that grain flowing exactly like it should. Well, it's the end of day. I'm all wrapped up with install. I apologize. The lighting is going to be a little bit bad in here, but just wanted to give you guys uh, a viewing of the finished product. You can really see the symmetry of this space with the windows, the panels being centered, and then we've got our three different lids. We'll flip up on here. We've got our vent down here. Let's take a closer look at that now. You can see a little bit better what we had going on. Probably can't see the vent under there, but um, this turned out really good. I'm, uh, I'm very happy with it. Here we go. We'll probably put some magnets on the back side of that later on. Everything is scribed in nice and tight to the wall. Again, stain grade white oak top on here. See my margins look really nice all the way around. I was really pleased with how everything came together. So we will use a 30 inch piano hinge on each of these lids later on. Painters got to do their thing on these first, so there's really no point in, in installing those yet. So I think this is going to be a really functional um, unit here. 
These pop off. I'm just going to pop them off so that I can show you the storage space on the inside. And as you can see, there will be a nice amount of storage in each one of these. The bottom on this is raised slightly for our vent. Did have an outlet there I had to cut in for, but uh, I'm very happy with this. I think it's gonna look great and be very functional. So I hope you guys enjoyed this build. I'm really satisfied with how it all turned out. Let me know what you guys think of this long form content. Honestly, I kind of enjoy making these longer project videos better. I feel like it's more in depth and you can actually um, learn a lot more this way, but I know it might not be for everybody. Let me know what you think in the comments. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you on the next video.